as, as one of the elements on the kind of the qualities of spirituality, you, uh, th then you can kind of start to asking, well, what are the different kinds of things that might feed into these intensifications of, of, of what I would call aggressive and uh, hubristic spiritualities and so forth? And uh, uh, does anybody really believe that, the, that America will be an empire for much longer? I don't think so. And people, that's, that's very, people really resent that. So you're going to say, well, we're going to keep uh, uh, guzzling the gas and driving the cars and, and, uh, and, and uh, making the investments that presuppose that. We're going to kind of, until we, until we you know, jump over the edge. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a tremendous discontent uh, with a changing uh, world condition. Uh, then then it, I think it, it was kind of uh, uh, surprising to a lot of people in the United States uh, to find out one day that uh, Christianity makes up uh, about 30% of the world's population. I really do think that. Not, not, not everybody, but a certain intense minority. Uh, and so then all of a sudden there's this much more visible sense of rubbing shoulders with multiple creeds and orientations in the world. And uh, I think of it this way, I mean, this is, might be a fantasy of mine, but, but sometimes when I'm talking to political scientists, uh, I, I will say that uh, theology departments are better at negotiating these differences than methodological disputes in political science are, in the social <laughs> sciences, because everybody invests theirs with a certain hubris. And I think that's writ large in these, in these kinds of things. So I definitely think that the intensity, the intensity has ratcheted up. And I definitely think that the, that the echo chamber of it is uh, the cable news, especially Fox News, and, uh, and then these, these think tanks where they're, they're ready at a moment to come on. And uh, you know, you can, you can hear, uh, because there's an alliance here, a resonance between kind of neoliberalism and economic theory and practices and, and a certain conception of, 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 uh, of Christianity. And in the, in the Gilder book that was all, the 81, they were all built, brought together because God uh, uh, provided an un providential underpinnings to a perfectly free market. Uh, so that was, that's 1981. I know it seems funny to you. Uh, that, that's 1981, uh, Wealth and Poverty, where he, where he kind of was prescient about how these two forces were going to be drawn together. And they have been drawn together, uh, and uh, so, and then you know a lot of my friends would said to me uh, when the uh, when capitalism Christianity came out, they said, "Well, now it's over because the Obama election." But the Obama election has intensified these things. They've reached, they've ratcheted up to a new level of intensity, and they, and they're willing to run really big risks for themselves because they they want to radicalize themselves in the hope that some of that will turn things their way. Uh, so uh, I don't have a full explanation for it. I kind of doubt that, that uh, even if I kind of tried really hard, uh, I, I would come up with one. Uh, but uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is more uh, embedded in the political situation than many people that I call secularists, of which, of course, I used to be one, uh, many people that I call secularists realized for a long time. And many people that William James calls intellectualists realized for a long time. Because they thought it was on the basis of polls and, and arguments and deliberation and policy things. And they didn't see these other kinds of, they didn't feel these other kinds of things operating in the, in the political system. So uh, I haven't answered your question really, but yes. The intensity is really high. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, when we were discussing the ethics of cultivation, as you see it within the processes of creation, as the sort of like fecundity yeah. of the mundane, you discussed the, the inherent impurity of the process. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, okay, so you have, you have different conceptions of morality or ethics and, and so uh, one of them could be kind of divine somehow divinely inspired or ordered and that would be two really or you could have the kind of the, the Kantian notion or you could have the, the, the Habermasian notion of a counterfactual and, uh, and other people's notions of a kind of fictive contract and so forth and uh, an ethics of cultivation is not reducible to any of those because an ethics of cultivation doesn't think that your fundamental ethical uh, orientations are derived. They, we don't think that they are derived from some kind of higher order 
argument or something. So, so if you as a constituency or an individual or something uh, have a, some degree of fortune in life, then uh, some degree of fortune in life, then uh, you might have as part of your being a certain kind of care for uh, the future of the world, for, uh, for presumptive diversity and so forth. And ethics of cultivation tries to build upon that, tries to cultivate that further. Now, what does it try to do? It doesn't try to uh, arrive at, uh, 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 at pure uh, transcendental principles that are unconditional and, and, uh, and, and, and work upon desire, which oftentimes in that, in that model, desire is kind of thought of as intractable and not that modifiable. Uh, it, what it tries to do is to, uh, uh, what it tries to do is to uh, infuse to a larger degree desire, belief, interest, identity, faith. Uh, it tries to infuse them. That's what I mean by saying it's the ethic of uh, cultivation thinks that ethics is impure, essentially. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and, and that uh, if, if you, if to the extent that happens in ethical life, uh, to that extent, the possibilities of, of, uh, of real pluralism increase. Uh, so, I don't think that an ethics of cultivation has been proven. It comes from it comes from an Epicurean, a Lucretian, <coughs> a Spinozist, a Nietzschean, a Deleuzean, a Foucauldian, uh, 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 those kinds of traditions. I don't think it's been proven, but I really don't think that many people in the other moral traditions in uh, academic life have come to terms with it. They think that you either accept this one or its preference, this or that. Uh, it's the excluded middle. Uh, and so that even Kant, uh, uh, talking about, he says, uh, he says, that, that Spinoza, what a, there's never been anybody more noble and moral than him. Unfortunately, his, his ethic was self-contradictory because he couldn't derive it from a universal principle. But that, that's not what Spinoza wanted to do. It was an ethic of cultivation. Uh, uh, and that's the whole point of the ethics. Uh, so, uh, uh, so in a conception of, uh, of imminence in a world of becoming, the, the, the situation that, um, the, the, theme that situ the ethical theme that situates the most uh, readily with it is a notion of, the, of ethics as cultivation and the impurity, the kind of essential impurity of it because of the human condition. And then if you, if you kind of focus on the becoming, well, then you cultivate, but that the, these fecund moments arrive when you have to act creatively and in an experimental way into the future. You don't know for sure what you're doing. That's the, the brilliance there is by William James when he says, action always starts in the middle of things, not at the beginning, not at the end, not at the top, not at the bottom, always in the middle of things in a world of real uncertainty. So, that, so, so I, I go for the ethics of cultivation. That's part of the, the one that I will try to adopt as a contestable orientation to ethics. And then I link it to a philosophy of becoming. Yeah? What do you think of the Zeitgeist moment? I don't know it. What is it? Which one? Um, well, basically it's uh, Okay. And um, the idea behind it is uh, equal distribution of the world's resources or something? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Possible and possible, why or why not? Yeah. Uh, I don't know it, but and, and I, I would uh, I would be attracted to it. But but my my basic approach is to try to in in various domains to develop an interim vision, and then develop militant commitments to it, and then kind of worry about what happens next, uh, because you, you'll be hit with surprises anyway. So an interim vision, uh, and the uh, and and you might kind of extrapolate out to a perfect vision, but uh, it would be nice if you could get even. Uh, a, a modest uh, kind of commitment to uh, respond to global warming, for starters. That will require militants. That uh, uh, interim visions require political militants today. So I don't know about the side guys. I would find it interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. 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 Uh, I'm not sure
Yes. Do you really mean to say militants? You said it a couple of times. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Say it another time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I think that I think that you uh, that soldiers. Oh, no, no, it doesn't mean soldiers. It could, military, but it doesn't have to, because the word militants has been applied to uh, uh, political movements without uh, committing to violence for decades and centuries. So uh, if, if you want to reduce the word to that, then I'll say, okay, I'll find another word, but it's got to be like militants. <laughs> uh, because because uh, you have to have a certain kind of fervent uh, commitment to pluralism, uh, or else it is. Uh, it's going to. Uh, it, it's going to face the uh, militants of Unitarians. So yeah, I'm willing to use the word. I mean, if, uh, and and uh, I, don't, I don't mean violence, and I don't mean don't mean military action. Would the word urgency possibly be helpful? Yeah, uh, I use it. It's in the paper. Yes, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I want to think about uh, certain urgent needs that. Uh, that uh, and then uh, 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 that and uh, you have an urgent need, and then you you don't say, well, what's the most probable? You say, what is a possibility that could speak to it? So so it's not a luxury to think about uh, uh, deep multiple. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Pluralism today is not a luxury. Uh, it is an urgent need to think about it because we do have this these pressures to minoritize the world along multiple dimensions at a faster pace. Uh, so it might have been, I don't know, it might have been a luxury sometime, I kind of doubt it, but it might have been a luxury, but now it's definitely not a luxury. And a lot of times people think of pluralists as kind of indulging in a luxury. Well, uh, yeah, you can indulge in it and, and, uh, and, and luxuriate in it, but it's also an urgency. Yeah, I like the word urgency. Yes, sorry. Um, just sorry to carry on with this sort of but um, when we're talking about the resonance machine and the creation of a pluralist resonance machine. Speak up just a little, thanks. Sorry. Yeah. In terms of the resonance machine uh, and the creation of a, a pluralist, I guess, resonance machine to, either, I'm not sure, this is kind of my question, is um, does pluralism just emerge as a sort of combative struggle against uh, Unitarianism or fundamentalism? Or, as you say, in pluralism, is it to foster an agonistic respect? Uh, presupposition of generosity, it seems like generosity as we discussed earlier today. Um, and, and so is it both? Is it one or the other? Um, and also, secondly, uh, what about micropolitics? How does that affect um, the construction of a plural, pluralist residence machine that you talk about in, uh, in your book, Pluralism? Um, because if that culminates in MSNBC, um, that makes me sad. So, because like, I, I, you, it's an open possibility, as we were talking about again earlier. Yeah. It's, it's not. It's nothing set in stone, so yeah. it can veer off. It right. can, you know, become this sort of very partisan, very um, you know, even MSNBC, in my opinion, a ridiculous. You know, maybe that has nothing to do with Fox. It just happens to be the, you know, the opposite of Fox News. Yeah. Um, uh, because. Because, you, in my judgment, you're speaking uh, to a situation that has the characteristics of a dilemma. And then you have to negotiate, try to find ways, thoughtful ways to negotiate the dilemma. So you have a, you have a notion of pluralism and you try to uh, uh, enact it and inspire it and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, reflect uh, those uh, generous modes and so forth. But you also, uh, when the pressure is on to really uh, torture people, terrorize them, uh, 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 start uh, unnecessary and reckless wars against them, uh, then you have to become, sorry, more militant with respect to those issues. So you have to play, you have to do the double kind of thing. And, and, and it's the, the attractive side is to, is to draw people in through, through showing the, the various kinds of relations that you make. So in capitalism and Christianity, American style, uh, I, 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 I talk about the Left Behind series and its relationship to certain uh, versions of cowboy capitalism, but then I try to engage uh, other set of evangelicals. Uh, and I, and I, I try to, I don't try to, I actually appreciate the kind of open theism that they're presenting and pursuing. And so I kind of support their gamble. It probably is going to get them into more trouble, but you know. Uh, uh, and, and so it, it, you can't just leave it at the, uh, at, at the, uh,